Beneath the obvious beauty of this Caribbean island and the rhythm of the music, there lies a festering discontent among the Cuban people. Because some people are just fed up with periodo especial. I mean, it's very nasty not to have soap and not to have medicine and not to have enough protein and not to have enough transportation, have to walk so much, and people are just getting fed up. The people of Cuba are living in a crisis, a special period. It's referred throughout the land as Periodo Especial. Since the collapse of the Eastern and Soviet nations, Cuba's front trading partners, the people here have been living through this new crisis with shortages of food, medicine, clothing, and most importantly, oil, for transportation and generation of electricity. The shortages are the consequence of a combination of the United States' economic blockade against the island nation and the collapse of the Eastern Bloc nations. Cuban pastor Elmer Labastida says the people are growing weary of the shortages. That's what the embargo does. People just stick out the things that they need for the simple things, oil for your kitchen, kerosene for your stove, uh, buses to get to your work and to your school or to your church. Simple things. The U.S.-led economic blockade has been in effect since 1963. It prohibits relations between any institution, business, or citizen of the United States and Cuba, initially imposed under the trading with the Fall of 1992, economic pressures against Cuba were increased under provisions of a new bill, the Cuban Democracy Act, sponsored by U.S. Representative Robert Torricelli of New Jersey. The Torricelli bill provides that any ship docking in the United States can be seized if it's docked in Cuba during the previous six months. It imposes sanctions against countries which provide assistance to Cuba and prohibits trade with Cuba by U.S. subsidiaries established in foreign countries. The tough new trade restrictions were quickly condemned by a General Assembly vote in the United Nations, a vote described in a Los Angeles Times story as a stinging rebuke for the U.S. The U.S. trade embargo was imposed against Cuba after Fidel Castro came into power in 1959 seizing billions of dollars worth of American business assets along the way. The U.S. government maintains the embargo is a legitimate response to the behavior of the Cuban government. The result? Rationing for everything. People queue in line for hours at a time for a few basic essentials. These people were waiting for pieces of bread. Others would stand in long lines for two heads of cabbage. Milk is in very short supply. Eggs, when they are available, are limited to four per person every 10 days. Pharmacy shelves are growing bare because of prohibitions against the shipment of medicines into Cuba. The principle is a little bit for everybody. There is no starvation, but hungry is a word very much in the vocabulary of Cubans. Hungry? Well, you know, it's not the hungry maybe of Somalia, you know? We, cannot, we are not starving like in Somalia, the, the people there, they are just dying because they don't eat in weeks, in days. Cuba is not like that. The state um, gives food. We have a card, a rational... Ration card. Ration card, yes, that's right. A ration card, and that's the, sometimes it's the minimum, the minimum, uh, the minimum that they can give us, but you you will not die with that. You will you wouldn't die with that, right. never never. But it but it's sometimes you feel hungry. Yeah, sometimes sometimes I I feel hungry. Yeah. Sure, and you have to go to black market, and that's it, because it's not enough. Rodrigo, not his real name, says the black market has become a way of life for Cubans in search of commodities in short supply. For example, a chicken, I don't know, the state, the state sells the chicken, I think it's three pesos, very cheap. And in the black market, you have to pay more than $100 per pesos for a chicken. For one chicken? Yeah, it depends on the weight, but uh, could be 80, 100, 120, 130. Pesos, pesos is very, very expensive, and the meat is quite expensive. Other essentials, like toothbrushes, eating utensils, and clothing, are all rationed. 
One new shirt or a new blouse, pair of pants or skirt is allowed each year and can be purchased only during the month designated on a person's ration card. If there are no shirts that month, the wait must continue for another year. Many articles of clothing have been restricted to one every two years. Gasoline is rationed to less than 10 gallons a month to private car owners. Public transportation has been severely restricted by oil shortages. People literally hang from the few Czechoslovakian-built buses still on the streets. Other forms of public transport are beginning to emerge, ranging from trucks to horse-drawn buggies to bicycles. The nation is converting to bicycles as a primary means of transportation, some acquired from the former Soviet Union and a million more coming from China. A bus factory in Havana has been converted to a bicycle factory. Highway construction has all but stopped, and many roadways are in a state of disrepair. Because of an inability to acquire replacement parts for vehicle repairs, parts are cannibalized from other cars. Trucks and buses run in such states of disrepair, many spew enormous amounts of pollution into the air with little apparent regard to the environment or to health. Perhaps not surprisingly, respiratory ailments afflict a significant portion of the patients treated at this children's hospital in Havana. Almost uh, one-fourth of our patients who come here come for that problem, respiratory diseases, asthma. Bueno, me estaba refiriendo a las enfermedades respiratorias agudas, pero tenemos también bastante asma. Well, I was referring to the acute respiratory diseases, but we also have a lot of asthma. Despite the shortages of food and medical supplies, the nation's infant mortality rate has dropped to less than 10 per thousand. That's one of the best rates in the world. Hospital officials here say even though medical supplies are hard to come by, they are coping. Well, we can guarantee you that, that no child has died because of a lack of medicine. <laughs> But, there, but we have had a great increase in the amount of difficulty in finding the, the medicine that we need. And I can tell you that as an administrator in this hospital, it's much more difficult in the state, it even has problems finding the medicine. Yeah. Cuba is very proud of its medical system, the finest of any third world country. It's a system that provides free medical and dental care to all Cuban citizens through an extraordinary network of family doctors, neighborhood clinics called polyclinics, supported by major hospitals throughout the nation. The medical system extends into schools. This is a school for the visually impaired. With a distinctly political curriculum, the hospitality and warmth extended to visitors here and throughout Cuba is warm and genuine. Cuba offers extensive educational opportunities for non-Cubans as well. These are students from the African nation of Mozambique. They're part of an extensive outreach program by the Cuban government to provide education opportunities for third world nations. Some of these students will study here for up to eight years before returning to their native countries. A sweeping education program has virtually eradicated illiteracy for Cubans throughout the nation. It's a centerpiece of the triumph of the revolution of 1959. These children are from the former Soviet Union, not here for education, but for medical care. 
These are all victims of radiation sickness caused by exposure to the Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986. 13,000 Chernobyl victims have been treated here, including 11,000 children. In order to become as self-sufficient as possible, an extensive farm production program has been put into place using school children and volunteers as a case of labor to toil the fields and harvest the crops. Cuban citizens are encouraged to volunteer two weeks each year working in the fields. Some agree to two-year working assignments in the fields. Agricultural researchers are anxious to show off the fruits of their labors, and field hands are appreciative of any encouragement they hear from sympathetic North Americans. Most of us have come to Cuba for the first time now. But we have been friends of Cuba for a long time. And we have been in this our government. Because we think the blockade is both immoral and illegal. And when we return to the United States, we will work even harder to end the blockade. The Castro government is attempting to develop a vigorous tourist trade industry throughout the country with American dollars as the standard currency throughout the network. Cuban pesos are forbidden within the tourist network. The contrasts are striking between the highly rationed people of the local Cuban population and the privileged tourist groups. Tourists have access to the country's finest hotels, best food, clothing, even liquor, all purchased with American dollars. Some airport soft drink machines will accept only American dollars and dispense more than soft drinks. Cuban access to those luxuries is restricted and in most cases prohibited. If you, if you would know Spanish, you would, you would hear the expression of the people, times in the lines. Sometimes they don't talk about Fidel as a, as a person, but they talk about the government, about the state, and they, they, they make comparisons against tourists, against, against, between Cubans, between um, tourists, mm -hmm. and, and they are talking in some way of Fidel, I think, because he's the, the, ma the main responsible of the situation as a president, of course. Anger over the U.S. trade embargo was evident in some very public ways. This billboard across the street from the United States entrance section in Havana reads on one side, my sling is David's sling. The biblical David and Goliath reference is not lost. And the billboard facing the U.S. interest section says, Senor imperialists, we are absolutely not afraid of you. Throughout the nation, pro-government political slogans appear everywhere. Anti-political voice slogans are rare. Their authors very often are in prison. Reverend Elmer Labastida meets with a group of 40 or so prisoners each month, many of whom have voiced opposition to the government. But they told me, because they knew I was coming here, I told them I was going to be with you. And they told me that they wanted me to tell you that uh, many of them are there because they are prisoners of conscience. I mean, they have their criticism to do against the regime, and it has not been accepted, and that's why they are there, and they wanted you to know that and to say that in your country. And I wanted to be faithful to them because I minister to them, uh, they say that they are not political prisoners. Well, who, who does the classification? <laughs> Many of them put, have put signs on the walls that say, Abajo Fidel, down with Fidel. Yeah. That is one of the reasons why they have been, they have been caught doing that. Many of them have been uh, distributing papers that say things against the government. Almer Labastida suggests government intolerance against those who disagree may be too harsh. But you know that the way that we have been harassed by, by influence from outside, especially from the North, has made, that's what Hisela said last night, has made our government paranoid, very ticklish about anything that is against. And, and this is something that we would like, that I would like as a Christian, uh, to see an, uh, an, an atmosphere of more possibility of expression, even very hard expression, because we do have, as we told you last night, the possibility of expressing our complaints against things that are going wrong. But uh, maybe there should come, political level should come up 
because we see that many people have that that uh, concern and it should be able to come up and that the revolution can stand that but so far it's not easy because the revolution feels so vulnerable it feels vulnerable another sentiment reflects the view of many in cuba who have grown weary of the embargo yet who remain proud unwilling to bow to the u.s economic pressures because in of uh, the situation we have the morale of the people is high we have problems Morale, really, because there are problems that raised from from this situation of not having enough enough of anything, mm -hmm. no, not enough medicine, not enough food, not enough. Uh, um, well, and that brings uh, uncomfort yes. to the people, no. But part of that, I I feel that the moral of the of the of the of the city of the people is high. A new sense of acceptance is developing between Christians and communists. I'm a revolutionary people. I'm a, a woman in this country. I'm very happy. I'm a communist of the party, but I'm very happy to live with the Christian people. I was educated in a Catholic way, so the revolution, for me, didn't want a contradiction between the Christian way of life and the way I live now. Yeah. And I only want to have the home and the voluntary to do to my country the things that I have been doing to this month mm -hmm. for a better future and for the goodness thing for everybody. If anything, the tensions have served to fuel a renewed interest in the church. A change in the Constitution in October of 1992 expressly prohibits discrimination against Christians. All the discrimination to Christian people, to, to believers in, in, our, in our country has disappeared. And uh, it's, it's not perfect, everything. We have even to work in that way, but have been have improved a lot this relation between church and state churches are reporting a 30 to 40 percent increase in attendance since the constitutional change as people hungry for spirituality search for something not provided by the communist socialism well as i say some of my just are are curious some of them may, uh, hear the music um some of them see a type of a relationship and community that they feel they need. A friend of mine, um, a member of the party, not too long ago, she said, Lois, I need to go to the church. I, I want to go to the church. And she's, she says, I need, I need. She, she found someone, a, a Christian who had helped her when, her when her daughter was ill. And she said she hadn't found that in the party. Cuban Ecumenical Council sees a closer relationship between church and state not previously known. With the government's blessing, the Ecumenical Council has retained a German engineer to help design and develop programs to clean up the environment. Programs ranging from energy resource recovery as a source of cooking oil for kitchens to cleaning up the dirty harbors. The Ecumenical Council is working, too, to encourage the United States to relax some of its trade restrictions, restrictions that have cut off pension payments to widows of Cuban pastors formerly employed by American churches. Let me put an example. One widow of a Presbyterian pastor here is a very old lady. And uh, she has in the United States, in the Board of Pension, more than $50,000. And she cannot receive that money. And she needs that money here. Because she needs it a lot. Prohibits them to send the money. And another another widow of a pastor has more than ninety thousand dollars in the world of pension. The Ecumenical Council and a number of Cuban pastors have requested a meeting with President Bill Clinton, hoping that as a church 
they can do what the two governments have been unable or unwilling to do, and that is to start a discussion that could eventually lead to normalization of relations and an end to the economic embargo. Raul Suarez is one of those requesting the meeting. And we would like for you to pray in your churches for this meeting. So that President Clinton can know that we want to meet with him. Because I believe it's important. Bush always listened to the Cubans who are outside of Cuba. Torricelli. Also was listening to the Cubans who are outside of Cuba. And now we, they also, the United government also needs to listen to the church that is within Cuba. This is diabolical to um, not let people have medicine and food. And the, the, the church cannot applaud this, applaud this. We want this to happen. Well, I have a hope that uh, maybe in the future everything will be better. Good. And uh, the church people in Cuba, and many other people in Cuba, and I know that many church people in the United States and many people in the United States, we are praying together and working together in order to improve the, the, our relations. <laughs> In the meantime, while churches hope to be the catalyst for normalization of relations, the people of Cuba continue to live and to celebrate life as best they can. Some dance. These are members of the Pancho Players, an all-deaf mime troupe. And life goes on. And you know, people oh, think sometimes with a stomach and that's, that's the problem in Cuba. People are thinking with the stomach. <laughs>